Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, November 13th, and we will hear the presentation Planning with Nature. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel. And for content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the questions box located in your webinar tool panel, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up, here we go, is a list of our sponsoring EPA chapters and divisions for 2020. Thanks to all of those participating for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, in particular, we are sponsored by APA's International Division, so thanks to you uh, for hosting today. Be sure to head over to ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. That's our webcast webpage, and that's where you can register for all of our upcoming sessions. On your screen is a list of all of our remaining sessions for 2020. Believe it or not, we're already booking sessions in 2021. Uh, so be sure to head over to our webcast webpage to register for all of these upcoming sessions. For those of you that need AICP CM credits, be sure to head over to planning.org and log into your My APA account. And from there, you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage. The session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. Be sure to head over to Facebook and search Planning Webcast and like us. That's where I post uh, any important uh, information such as date changes or time changes or when new sessions are available to register, that's where I post that sort of information. So be sure to head over there and like us and head over to YouTube and search planning webcast. We'll pop up there, uh, like a, or uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We record all of our sessions and post them up there. We have over 300 videos. We have over 3,100 subscribers. So be sure to join us so that you get up-to-date information when we post new sessions. And we'll also have a PDF copy of this presentation available at the conclusion of today's session uh, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And there you are also able to find some distance education on demand sessions. We have two sessions available for ethics credits and two available for law credits. If you need those, you can view those on demand and get those credits uh, through the end of this year. So be sure to head over to our webcast webpage for all that good information. All right, that's it for my housekeeping items. Uh, again, as you have questions, be sure to type them in the chat box and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. So I am going to turn it over now to Valeria who will kick us off. And I just turned those controls over to you. Yes. So Can you see you. my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, hello everybody. My name is uh, Valeria Leiva. I am an architect and an urban planner. I am originally from Mexico, but having been living in the Netherlands for the last three years, um, I came here to pursue my master in urban management and development. And I also did a specialization in climate change and sustainability. I decided to stay and now I have my own uh, company. And what I am doing right now is that I started a collaboration with a Dutch urbanism uh, firm where we organize events uh, and workshops related to the topic uh, women, water, and urban life. Uh, and what I'm going to present right now is uh, a research I conducted for my master thesis, which is about the impact of water scarcity in women's life, the case of Iztapalapa, Mexico City. My slides are not changing. One second. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes the first slide gets stuck. If you right click your mouse and hit next, you should be fine from that point. Mm. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, uh, this is the content of my presentation. First, I'm going to talk about uh, the water scarcity in general terms. Then I'm going to go deeper into the context of Iztapalapa. Uh, then I'm going to bring those topics together. Uh, afterwards, I want to talk about social inequality, how the social inequality is reflected in access to water. And then uh, I will uh, bring it together to the top with a, with a gender perspective uh, topic, that is uh, how the wa uh, water crisis affects uh, women's life. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the life conditions, how is the quality of life affected, and after I will finish with a conclusion and some recommendations. Um, water is a source of life and a natural resource that supports the environment, but it can also be the origin of risk and vulnerability. Climate change has been in the world's agenda for a long time. Uh, and during the last years, the impact of this phenomenon in water supply has become more important uh, because of the rapid population growth and urban concentration. And also proof the inefficiency of the government to meet uh, the city's growing needs. It is clear that uh, it will affect both parts, the demand side and the supply side as well. According to the WHO and UNICEF, the poor and the marginalized groups are the ones with lacking access. Despite being a problem that affects directly these groups, women are disproportionately affected by the water crisis. The UNDP Human Development uh, Report said that globally, millions of women and young girls are forced to spend hours collecting and carrying water. This, uh, of course, restricts their opportunities and their choices. This crisis holds back poverty reduction and economic uh, growth in the world's poorest countries. One of the most uh, relevant examples and which has caused the most controversy is the case of the Iztapalapa delegation in Mexico City. So Mexico City is an agglomeration of neighborhoods, which are actually large cities. According to the, according to the INEGI data from 2015, eh, Itapalapa has almost 2 million inhabitants, which is similar to the population size of Vienna or Hamburg. Itapalapa also has the highest population density in the country and the less favorable socioeconomic indicators. The lack of infrastructure and urban services, especially in the distribution of drinking water, is one of the most important challenges for the local government. Mexico City has two main water supply systems. that are the Lerma and the Kutsamala system. However, social segregation and the location of social classes make a big difference in the water supply between the different delegations of Mexico City. So now uh, I'm going to bring the water scarcity problem to this context. This is how the World Bank describes the water infrastructure in Mexico City as inefficient, unsustainable, and unequitable. For decades, the people there have survived with a permanent rationing since sometimes they can spend several uh, weeks without receiving a single drop of water in the supply networks. Uh, in Iztapalapa, for example, the water consumption uh, is 28 liters per day per capita. And if you compare with richest neighborhoods where the consumption per capita goes between 800 and 1,000 liters per day. So everything that has to do with water in this city is reduced to inequality. In this context, the water crisis can be translated into who owns the water and who has, who has the means to pay for it. 
So as I, um, as I already mentioned, I conducted this research in 2018, and I had the opportunity to go to Mexico City and perform a face-to-face -face service. I uh, only focus on how women live and perceive this problem, and also how is their life affected. Uh, so for this, first, I needed to know how was their water situation, and I asked three main questions. The first one is, do you have access uh, to drinking uh, water in your home? And 57% of the respondents said yes, that they do have access to drinking water. The second water, the second question, sorry, was that in case your answer is yes, is the service constant? And almost half of the respondents said that yes, the service was constant. But then I move on to the third question, which is how many days a week do you receive water? And it was very surprising that almost half percent of the respondents said that they have water in their home only one or two days per week. So what can be concluded from this is that they have lived all their life with a lack of this basic service that they no longer perceive it as a deficiency. It became a way of life to only receive water one or two days, and they still think they have a constant service. So the previous results uh, brought up another important question. If there is no or not enough water coming out from the pipelines, how do they get water for the daily use? And for this, they have three main sources of water. The first one are water bottles. They use this water for personal hygiene and for cooking. However, we also need to take into account that a huge amount of garbage is generated and that is this is this also represents uh, an extra expense for every household. The second option is that they capture rainwater. And the third option is that they make use of the water trucks. The water trucks uh, is a service provided by the federal government. And it is an operating system with a purpose to fill the tanks, the water tanks of the neighborhood. The process to ask uh, for this service is really simple. Uh, they only need to make a call, they give their address and wait for the water to be delivered. However, it's not as simple as it seems because uh, it is supposed to be free of charge, but it is not. Uh, it is unregulated, it is not uh, constant and is dangerous for women. One of the most uh, repeated answers was that uh, if they want to receive the water, they must deal directly with the drivers. Uh, water pipe trucks always ask for a fee, or they even ask women to ride with them to deliver the water as soon as possible. So this is when also it is, uh, this water crisis starts to be personal and starts to be dangerous for women. And as I already said, for women, the water crisis is personal. The main question of my research was to know how does the inequality in the distribution of drinking water affects the quality of life of women living in Iztapalapa? But why is the water crisis a women's issue? The United Nations Department said that women's lives all around the world are closely connected to water. Being Mexico, a country with strong traditions, the role of the women has slowly started to change. However, in the most marginalized and poor areas, as is the case of Iztapalapa, it remains the same. And their position in the society is being housewives almost 100% of their time. 
women can uh, spend several hours a day collecting water. And of course, this directly affects girls' education, women's ability to have a job, uh, and this has a negative impact in their quality of life and limits their opportunity for progress. And this can be supported by the results of the service. 86% of the women that I uh, interviewed said that they are completely dedicated to the housework, which was obviously reflected in the level of studies they had a chance to complete. 60% uh, of them only finished secondary school and only 10% had the opportunity to finish a bachelor degree. UN Water says that women are trapped in a cycle of poverty due to the lack of water. So how do women face the problem of not having access to drinking water? This is only one of the many statements I collected during my fieldwork, and it really shows how tough and hard is uh, their lives. I wake up at 5.30 a.m. to prepare everything and take my kids to school. Once I come back, I verify how much, how much water is left in case there is still some. And as I don't know when are we going to get more, I prioritize the activities. Most of the times I use the water for the housework, for personal hygiene and cooking, we always buy water bottles. The other scenario is that when there is no water left, I call the water truck. Receiving this service could take from three days till two weeks. I need to stay at home for the service because if the water pipe truck arrives and nobody's there, the service is canceled and I need to start the process all over again. If we do not receive water on time, I walk long distances trying to find a water truck. If I find one, I pay an extra fee and try to convince the driver to deliver water in my home. I prefer to be in charge of this activity rather than my daughter because many times the drivers have asked, asked me to ride with them until we get there. This situation is very scary and uncomfortable where I do not have other options. After listening to this kind of statement, it becomes very clear what type of life they have and how limited are their options. Another statement that was uh, constantly repeated is that in order to save water, they try to avoid cooking and washing dishes. Uh, and the solutions they apply is that they buy fast food or, and they use disposable plates. For personal hygiene, they mentioned that it's very important to buy water bottles because in the past they had uh, digestive and skin problems due to the bad quality, of course, of the water that comes from the pipelines and water trucks. So how is their quality of life affected? They are forced to drop off school to help, to help their moms with the housework. So due to the lack of skills and knowledge that they would normally acquire during studies, it is almost impossible to get a job in the labor market and this prevents them from being independent. They face several health problems because uh, due to the bad quality of the water and the constant consumption of fast food. They are exposed to the dangerous situation when trying to get uh, water, such as fights, robbery, and rapes. So living with fear all the time becomes normal. So my conclusion here is that from the moment in which women have a pre-established role in the society, 
that keeps them in the world of domestic work and deprives them of their rights and freedom, such as the right to education, it becomes clear what type of life they will have ahead. It is, of course, a reality that the lack of water affects their life for the simple fact of not having access to this basic service for life. However, because everything becomes more complicated when they are the only responsibles for collecting it. However, women are already resilient to this crisis and they have been able to organize themselves by helping each other and building a strong sense of community. They, for example, take uh, morning and night watch turns to wait for the water truck. Uh, some others go and make long lines to ask for the service and some others uh, carry the water. These are very different tasks, but they all have one thing in common, and is that they are all willing to do whatever it takes to have water. It is clear that women are the world water providers, but they are excluded from all the decisions related to water management. UN Water said, that this central role of women is often overlooked in efforts to improve management of water resources. Women often have no voice in decisions about the kind of services they receive. The global water crisis is solvable and women are critical change agents uh, in this global water crisis. So here are only four uh, recommendations that can be taken into account to really change the situation. The first one is that it is very important to start taking into account the women, especially indigenous women. They have a very extensive knowledge regarding water resources. This goes from location, quality, management, and storage methods. The second one <coughs> is that it is uh, really important to improve access to water for all, because this will also allow women and girls to use their time in other activities. They can attend school, generate income, have a job, have hobbies, do other activities that they normally don't do because they don't have the time. The third one is uh, equal access for women to water and land are key factors to fight against poverty and hunger. Equal rights for women means a secure nutritional base. And the last one is to target women and men equally in water education and training programs is really important to start including both of them in training programs for the operation and maintenance of water facilities. This will help to ensure sustainability of technologies and infrastructure. And with that, I conclude, conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valeria, for this interesting presentation. Um, my name is Matthias Baun. I'm going to sort of follow up with something that is a bit more, uh, I would say, physical. Um, I'm I'm a founder uh, of, of One Architecture and Urbanism, which is an originally uh, Amsterdam-based, but now also a uh, New York-based uh, design and planning firm. And I'm also faculty at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, I came to the Netherlands uh, about, what was it, six years of, I came from the Netherlands to the US about 
six uh, years ago when I co-led a team together with a Danish architect called Bjarke Ingels in the Rebuild by Design competition with a project called The Big U. And, and some of you might know this project. And this project was a project for the flood protection of Lower Manhattan. It was developed in the wake of uh, Superstorm Sandy. And since then, my office has been working very hard at uh, the planning and design of the different compartments of this coastal protection system. Uh, ESCR is a well-known project on the east uh, uh, side of Manhattan. We're now working on the financial district uh, 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 master plan. And one of the things that we continue to find out when uh, doing these type of uh, projects is that it is when you're working in these very urban environments, it is really difficult in the United States in a way for regulatory reasons to uh, do things in water. But also that one of the things that we found out is that these projects are really, really complicated. They take a lot of effort, a lot of money. Weaving in and adapting cities to climate change is hard work that just costs a lot of money. And as I said earlier, this is a project that, that we have proposed in Boston together with the landscape architecture firm Stoss. Uh, you often see that, that having sort of involving nature in coastal protection solutions is something that is very, very challenging. And it's for that reason that my firm and I have uh, spent the last uh, number of years to sort of almost develop a parallel practice to understand better how we can start building with nature or use nature-based solutions at scale for hydrological engineering uh, problems. And the result of that uh, work is a book that has just been uh, uh, presented and that will be in bookstores, uh, I hope within the, within the month, which is called Building with Nature, creating, implementing, and upscaling nature-based solutions uh, in which I'm one of the co-editors and for which my office has uh, helped a lot with both illustrating these concepts and putting them into the, let's say, urban systems or landscape systems so that we can make them more productive. So let's start with talking a bit about what building with uh, uh, nature is and maybe a good example of building with uh, uh, nature, and it's an example that the consortium that we work with, EcoShape, has been intimately involved with, is the sand uh, uh, motor, the sand motor, the sand motor in Dutch, the sand engine of the coast of uh, the Netherlands, just north of the port of uh, Rotterdam. And it was a, a project that tried to solve the problem of uh, continuous sand uh, 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 suppletions uh, uh, that uh, had to be uh, taking place along the Dutch uh, uh, coastline, which, as you might know, is largely a sandy uh, coastline. Adding sand at multiple places uh, 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 with quite frequently brought with it uh, severe ecosystem uh, destruction and uh, was also very costly. And so the folks behind this project said, why do we not basically just put up a lot of sand on one place along the coast and then having the tides and the currents disperse the sands uh, so that, that basically the sand moves north along the coast and starts to supply uh, beaches and dune systems uh, uh, north. And then with that, uh, you not only use the for, uh, forces of nature, or harness the forces of nature to uh, do the work that normally dredging companies would uh, uh, do, but you also create a really interesting and dynamic uh, ecosystem along this uh, coast. So this is what the sand motor looks uh, uh, looked at the beginning when it was quite a lot of sand and slowly as the sand was deposited, you see new formation of land and new formations of, of all kinds of ecosystems on this uh, uh, on this piece of uh, 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 land. 
And in such a way that it not only provides all kinds of ecosystem services, but also that it becomes a really fantastic place for people to kite surf and to do all kinds of other recreational uh, activities. And so this project in a way really encapsulates the essence of, I think, building with nature is trying to sort of use uh, and, and harness the forces of nature to develop these multiple uh, benefits. Another project that is relatively well known is on a Dutch interior lake called the Marker Wadden, which is a lake that had a very bad water quality because it was a relatively shallow and a uh, lake with a relatively uh, 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 minimal dynamics and in that the idea was to uh, um, uh, construct a, a ring dike which uh, could be made of dredged sediment which is a byproduct of sand mining in this lake and with that uh, it would be possible to build a set of sort of new islands which would also then start to um, uh, perform all kinds of ecosystem services, uh, drastically improving the water quality in this inner lake, but also uh, uh, becoming the basis for sort of new nature developments as well as new recreational development. So here again, you see a, a project as it was constructed at the beginning by the dredging companies. And this is what it's starting to look. Uh, now you see the ecosystems coming up, you see nature being developed, but you also see uh, uh, some interventions that are in a sort of typical Dutch way, I would say, uh, uh, introduced for all kinds of recreational uh, uh, benefits. And one of the things that you do when you develop such projects is that you think, well, this is, this is new, you can consider this a sort of pilot uh, project. Um, so part of what EcoShape do is really setting up extensive programs to sort of understand these processes that are happening, to measure the processes, to develop metrics, and really to consider this building with nature projects in some way as a living map, living lab for adapt adaptive management of uh, inner, inner lakes. A third uh, uh, project uh, uh, that I'd like to uh, show is another project in the Netherlands, which is in Dutch called the Klei Rijperij, in uh, English that would be called the Clay Ripener, which uh, deals with um, sediment material that is the byproduct of dredging activities in the northern port of uh, Del Cell. And the idea here was uh, to think if that sediment material in an estuary close to the port could be reused uh, and made into actual clay that could be used to uh, not only uh, elevate lands, but also build new levees as the levees needed to be increased in size because of a changing uh, climate and, and sea level rise. And so the idea of the clay Rijperij is to bring the dredging material and uh, basically develop a number of basins in which you could store the dredging material and then treat that uh, dredging material in each of these basins differently by doing different processes for dewatering, for getting the salt out, for uh, 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 growing different plants in it, so that we could evaluate which practice works best for reusing the clay. So this is what this looks like and it's really what you see here, this sort of weird combination of large-scale infrastructure uh, 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 development and uh, 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 machinery uh, together with really the use of these natural processes in trying to understand how to make the clay, the clay such that it can be used in these widened and raised levees as you see uh, uh, here. And what is really interesting for this, like in these projects, like in all the 
projects that we do at EcoShape, uh, we have dredging companies, engineers, knowledge institutes, uh, uh, not-for-profits involved because of the combined uh, benefits, but that also really creates an interesting sort of mix of interest and outcomes of such projects. So on the one hand, we have the engineers and the dredging companies who are really interested in, in ways in which they could reuse the sands and with that uh, uh, solve a lot of the, uh, uh, or create efficiencies in dredging and resource management. It was also really interesting for the ecologists in the uh, uh, knowledge institutes is to understand the ecological development that would happen in each of these uh, 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 basins and basically trying to figure out at the scale of acres or uh, square miles even how these ecological systems could be piloted and so some of the ecologists were really excited about the fact that they were allowed to experiment at a scale that they don't uh, normally experiment in still relatively controlled uh, environments and then of course after the water is out this is what the clay starts to look like this work that has been mostly done in the uh, uh, Netherlands is now being transported in uh, international context. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in Asia, where this uh, project in the MAC Indonesia was the first one, but we're sort of rolling out these approaches of building with nature at the scale of, uh, uh, let's say, the continent in, in uh, five different countries at this moment. In the Mak, what was really interesting in Indonesia, this is a city on the northern coast of, of, of Java that is slowly sinking into the ground, it's slowly uh, subsiding. Uh, you could see that the nature's the natural protective systems, the, the mangroves were being eroded away. And there the idea of the building with nature project would be to say, can we find a way to restore the mangrove belt on this northern uh, coast where all these uh, fishing uh, villages uh, are. And the idea of this building with nature project was to create permanent, uh, permeable structures parallel and perpendicular to the uh, shore made out of bamboo that would not only attenuate the waves, but create, uh, let's say, zones with little wave action so that the sediments could uh, settle behind those structures and basically create new land on which the mangroves could start to grow. And so the idea here, mangroves are great uh, 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 plants, right? They are uh, not only provide a host of ecosystem services uh, in terms of carbon uh, sequestration, but they attenuate waves themselves and they are fantastic uh, 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 places for shorebirds and juvenile fish and 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 uh, etc. to uh, to grow. They almost form protected nurseries for a lot of different uh, species. So here are some of the permeable structures that that have been built uh, that are being built by the by the local uh, community. This is what they look like and and slowly we see the coast strengthening and the mangrove uh, mangrove belts uh, coming back to life but what's really interesting here is that that in the context of indonesia we're spending a lot of time to work with the local communities to not only have them help construct and maintain these structures but also to understand their importance and to profit from the uh, uh, benefits that these structures uh, bring. So community engagement and working with the community is a really, uh, a really critical piece of this, uh, of, of, of this work. And what we try to do in this diagram uh, from the book is to really show how that works how in a way there's a relationship between the mangrove restoration and the development of uh, aquaculture 
how uh, there was a combination of engineering firms and knowledge partners as part of the uh, eco uh, uh, shape consortium who, who uh, brought in the expertise to conceive this project but it was really the local communities together with the uh, uh, local universities and a, and a sort of uh, a local capacity building institutes that have been set up for this that would help to engage the community to deliver the project and to also make sure that it gets uh, maintained. And the results of that are fantastic, right? So, so not only uh, do you see a real uh, comeback of the ecosystems, but it's also a place that people like to visit. So it's kind of starting to be linked to ecotourism. These are my Penn students that I uh, uh, took there and with whom we then eat uh, the local uh, 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 fish. And so we create a sort of, and, 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 and in a way improve the local uh, uh, community. These are just four projects out of many that this EcoShape Consortium has uh, developed over time. And one of the things that we have done in, in the book is to sort of describe the different concepts that underlie this work and that we now understand better through these actual pilots and sort of place them into landscapes and hope through that to inspire other people to think about building with nature solutions within their particular environments. So the book consists of a series of concepts and a series of landscapes. These concepts are explained and uh, visualized and sort of connected to specific outcomes in specific projects. Concepts go from uh, 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 restoring ecosystems to enhancing all kinds of natural dynamics, uh, uh, playing around with beneficial uses of uh, uh, settlements uh, and uh, creating also uh, tidal parks and secondary channels and, and sort of much more uh, engineered solutions where we still harness the forces of, of, of nature. So we do that, we explain the concepts and then we place them in a number of different sort of fictional landscapes to help people understand how these concepts could be utilized. So here we have a sandy coast that is somewhat based on, let's say the sand, uh, motor that I, sand motor that I uh, showed you earlier in which we say we need to understand better how to do a seabed landscaping. We have of course the mega nourishments that we talked about. So we can start to construct islands with, with that. Uh, there's all kinds of in-water uh, ecology that we can improve and, and in a way we can use that as a basis to enhance dune dynamics or develop uh, coastal protection uh, systems. Similarly for muddy coasts, uh, there's a lot of thinking, uh, not only about the beneficial uses of uh, uh, sediment, but also how that connects to the uh, local population. In lowland lakes, uh, which is the Marco Wadden example that I uh, showed you, uh, uh, really shoreline management as well as the creation of islands are uh, things that you want to pay attention to. In rivers and estuaries, of course, you have uh, uh, also a lot of sediment uh, 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 issues, um, yeah, but you also want to do work related to flood control. There are all kinds of urban uh, applications that are can start to be imagined as results of the pilots that we have been uh, uh, working on. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of thinking about how this can be developed in port environments, specifically because people slap around with a lot of uh, material in these uh, port environments that that if you don't do it well can have quite negative environmental uh, impacts but if you do it well can actually create a lot of uh, benefits and compensate for the negative uh, uh, environmental impacts of port development. Um, in, the, in the book we then 
talk and start to show how in each of these systems, because once you start to think about building with nature, I think it's really critical to have a systemic approach on uh, what building with nature can be and a systemic uh, view. So what we try to do in the book is to, in a systemic way, show, for instance, the ecological uh, benefits. And uh, that could mean in this particular example, which is related to the uh, river landscape, is to show how different biotopes support different species and how those biotopes relate to uh, uh, each other and what, uh, let's say, hydrological environments uh, works best for them. In terms of, let's say, people, you could think about the places to live, work, and visit. And here we illustrate in the context of the lowland lakes, the recreational benefits that you can start to have, but also the way in which you want to position your uh, research. And this is an image in this case for the Sandy Coast, but we have them for all in which we show the uh, sediment flows and the resource flows in these particular uh, landscape. And then of course, as I showed earlier, it's really the integrated approach that makes this type of work special, but also successful. It is the fact that uh, we have engineers working with ecologists. We have the fact that we have knowledge institutes working with business. We have the fact that we have activists working with designers in, in and that we have uh, like uh, 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 international knowledge connected to local knowledge and local energy. That is really what makes this uh, uh, work uh, special. So we talk <laughs> a lot and try to explain how that works in these particular uh, landscapes. Here, a few other shots uh, from the book, which show a bit more uh, uh, the case of the muck. Here, you see the problems of subs from subsidence in a much more clear way. And we also see the, the magnitude of the challenges that you have on the northern coast of uh, Java. Here uh, are uh, sort of a bit more zoomed in uh, uh, the, the sort of testimonials, you know, if, if you want it, of the different people in the villages who have been part of this uh, building with nature uh, project. But of course, in the book, we also talk a lot about the sort of scientific research that is related to it and the outcomes that we have uh, uh, there. Um, uh, to conclude, uh, and I think it's also the conclusion of the book, what we really wanted with the book is not only tell the story of this work and show the sort of systemic connections of this work, but also to, to almost make it like a manual of doing your own building with nature uh, projects or planning with nature projects and, 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 and focus in the enablers that make these type of projects uh, possible, which is the institutional embedding. You really need to, once you want to do these type of projects, really need to understand how this work connects to all kinds of international frameworks and uh, local institutions that could help you advance this work. We think, and maybe we are very Dutch in that, that's uh, underlying every project with a sound business case, which considers funding and financing is really important. And uh, a part of what is the real challenge now, for instance, in the building with Nature Asia is a uh, project is really program is to really sort of connect these type of projects to, for instance, the lending practices of the international financial institutions like the World Bank and, and the ADB. Critical issues, of course, is like you're dealing with nature, things grow slowly, there's a lot of unpredictability on it. In that sense, it's very connected to the world that I am familiar with, which is climate adaptation. So you need to create adaptive practices for management, maintenance, and monitoring. 
course, you need a multi-stakeholder approach. We need to, to strengthen the technical and systems knowledge that is really important, uh, uh, both at the level of these landscapes themselves, but also within the broader systems that they operate in. And uh, you'll, of course, realize that capacity building for all this is a critical element. So really thinking through how do we do this project is a critical element of building with nature and finding the right coalitions and, and connecting that to the ground is really critical for its uh, success. Um, thank you is thank you in Dutch. Um, I'll leave it to questions now. And I do hope that you'll find a way to get hold of, of uh, this book. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Um, so folks, if you have questions, like I said before, just go ahead and type those into um, the GoToWebinar tool panel there and we'll see what we can get answered here. Um, so the first question is for Valeria. And it is, you mentioned that it's especially important to include indigenous women in decision-making and planning projects. Will you please talk about how gender and ethno-racial identities create compounding inequality? So more specifically, did you find in your work that those who identify as indigenous women have even less access to water than those who do not identify as indigenous? And if yes, how was this manifested in the in the data? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that when I went there and I conducted my research, it was very clear uh, how the city is divided. Like uh, there, uh, there is this social segregation and these social classes that um, like the indigenous people lived in the most poor and marginalized areas where the rich people live in very high uh, in uh, skyscrapers and um, yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So uh, the city for me, or what I could perceive is that the city is sending the water to those neighborhoods, to the rich neighborhoods. And uh, the poor and the, the poor areas don't don't have access to that water. So uh, yeah, I mean the people who are living there specifically um like the women don't have access to this water, don't have options, uh, and the government and, and, and planners don't really, uh, I, I wouldn't say planners, but I would say that the government is still denying this problem, is sending the water to the rich areas, and they are just not caring about who is living in the marginalized, uh, the marginalized ones. So women living there, of course, face the most severe, uh, the most severe consequences, because they are what, what, what I mentioned in my in my presentation. No, they are trapped in that cycle of poverty because they don't have access to water. So every day, all day, they are thinking about that. And if they want to have a job to to go outside of that of that social class or to have better opportunities, they simply can't. So they are basic, basically trapped there. So that's what I could see when I was uh, doing my, my, my research. I don't know if that answers the question or... If they have more, they can go ahead and type in anything else that, that you okay. want her to explain. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll keep with you for a moment. In the case of water scarcity in Mexico City and its impacts on women, has there been any progress in adopting your recommendations? It's very surprising that, I don't know, it was like one or two months ago, I was uh, doing some research because I was preparing a, a workshop. And I found one company that is called Isla Urbana. I don't know if you have ever heard about them. But actually, when I was doing my research, they started a project, which was actually uh, they uh, designed systems to capture rainwater. And they specifically, 
uh, install those systems in Iztapalapa and two other neighborhoods. I, I don't remember right now the names. So I don't know, I, I didn't know about this. And for me, it was very surprising that exactly the same year I started doing this research, this started happening. So it's not a topic that is on the agenda. And it's still some, uh, the government is still like denying that that problem is existing. But I think that there are other people and organizations, NGOs, that are becoming more aware of these problems and, and are starting to create a, a change. Thank you. Um, let's flip over to Matthias. Are your floating marshes human-made island from, for example, Floating Island International, uh, which is a company? Have you used such islands frequently in your projects? Uh, no, we we haven't used those islands, and I, I don't know of them, but I'll definitely look them up. I would be very interested to see how those work and also how those perform, because there's a really interesting qualities that floating islands can have, because they, uh, uh, because they have an underside, they can also have an incredible set of benefits for marine life. So I would, I would love to hear more about that. Okay, thank you. Um, next one, we'll flip back to you. Um, this question is, um, what, why do the households only get water twice a week? Why is the government not providing it more consistently? Is it a supply problem or a political problem? Yeah, I mean, every house has uh, the connection to receive the water. However, it's very uh, bad uh, maintained. So if the water comes from uh, the Lermauk or Kutsamala system, on the way, it, there, there is a lot of water that is lost. So first, that what, the water that, uh, that, can, that arrives is sent to the richest neighborhoods, and then what is left, they send it to the poor areas. And of course, on the way, a lot of water is lost, and because the pubs are very bad uh, maintained, the water arrives dirty. So it, I, I, I don't know, I, I will say that this is like a political problem because they know that it, that, that is there and uh, for decades people have been living like this. So it's, it's, it's a part that uh, a political problem and another problem is that, okay, if they already managed so many years, let's uh, leave it like this and we focus on other things. So that is the, the situation right now. Okay. Um, Matthias, I, I think this is for you. I'm, I can't recall the reference to this. Did you talk about the East Little Havana CDC? Was that you, did you speak about that? No, I did not. No. Okay, Was that? it says, please provide more information on East Little Havana CDC. So neither one of you know what that's in reference to? No. Okay, then it's not just me who doesn't know what that's in reference to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> did I not pay attention to something? Okay, uh, next question. Um, okay, so I thought about this as well. Um, so this is for you, Valeria. Why can't the government have each neighborhood just build their own infrastructure like utility lines, um, water, sewage treatment? Um, wouldn't it be much more productive for residents to focus on building um, the community infrastructure versus trying to gather water and other resources. Again, I, I suspect you might say that it could be a little political, uh, but if you could just speak to that a little bit. Yes, I think that there are a lot of interests involved. And this goes beyond uh, water. It goes to who has the power, to who has the means to pay for this. So, um, Unless uh, they stop thinking in that way, I, I don't think that something can can change. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a comment just came through regarding the political problem concerning water. A very interesting take on this can be found in an accessible form in the Dictator's Handbook, which isn't really just about dictators, but uh, politics <laughs> of development in general. So for those of you interested, uh, scratch down the dictator's handbook for more information on that if you if you haven't heard of it. Um, mm -hmm. This one is for Matthias. Um, 
Curious about the use of trees and their ecosystem services as part of stormwater flood mitigation uh, and green infrastructure projects. Are there good examples of this approach in the upcoming book? Relatively few, and that, that has to do with the fact that this book really focuses on hydrological engineering projects. And so they're almost all in, in water-related environments. So trees have fantastic function, uh, 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 capacity for all kinds of ecosystem services. Uh, there's a great variation between trees in, in the types of ecosystem services that they can uh, uh, provide and also their ability to function in, in uh, uh, different environments. We find that in the environments that these uh, building with nature projects uh, operate that it's really uh, mangroves that that are uh, critical and there's there is a couple of things that we've learned about uh, mangroves one is that there's a lot of mangroves planting programs mangrove restoration programs around the world uh, we've been doing with the office a lot of projects in the philippines where you see that often the selection of the wrong species and sort of a too limited awareness of that really hampers the sustainability of whatever mangroves you plant there. And so that's one of the reasons that in a project such as the MAC, we said, let's not plant any mangroves. Let's create the conditions through which mangroves can grow by basically providing the shelter and the land that, that they would need in order to uh, uh, start growing. And I think that as an approach has been a real insight. It's like, like it's very easy to, like I think part of what, what makes Building with Nature, I think such an important program has been the fact that there's just a lot of science behind it. And there's, a, there's many lessons that are, that are learned and, 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 uh, understanding the nuances of tree planting in general has been a really important one there. I hope, I know it's not the answer that you wanted, but I, I do hope that for people that are interested in trees, some of these considerations uh, can also apply to their work. Um, we'll stick with you for a moment. At, at what level of government are these projects initiated? You know, are we talking local? Is it regional? And I think most importantly, how are they funded? So, so that really depends. Uh, um, if if I go with these projects that I that I just showed, the funding for the sound motor came from the National Infrastructure Agency, let's say the Dutch uh, Army Corps of Marine, uh, 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 Army Corps of Engineers, sorry, uh, who also, by the way, in the United States have a fantastic engineering with nature program, uh, Top Bridges runs that, uh, uh, they do fantastic work, but there it was really the primary driver was to do coastal uh, sand supply uh, cheaper and uh, in a less destructive way. The funding uh, from uh, the Marka Wadden came to a large extent, so those are the, in, uh, the islands, came from uh, by a large extent uh, through uh, philanthropy who uh, wanted to invest in the ecological quality of this inland lake. And the other part of the funding came, or and that was actually the large part, but it, it, like the tipping point was this philanthropy, and a large part came because of the sand mining that was associated with it. So basically, this lake is water, it's shallow water, under that it has a, a, a five meter layer of clay, under that there are sand. Clay is worthless, or this for clay is worthless, sand is uh, worth a lot of money. So in order to get to the sand, we needed to, uh, or they needed to get rid of all this other uh, sediments. And it's that other sediment that has been sort of reconfigured in these islands. And so it's the sand mining that was the cost uh, that, 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 that paid for it. In the clay ripener, 
the it's the use of the resources combined with uh, the dredging uh, efficiencies in the harbor combined with again uh, a, a sort of nature conservation uh, philanthropy that combines the funding i think uh, and and in, in in like all these projects they sort of come to me through brainstorming right coming together with different folks and think about how can we connect the pieces in indonesia it was the ministry of fisheries who has been very important in making this happen as well as the uh, uh, provincial government and the local governments uh, local government specifically there was a mayor who really believed in this work and he convinced the different villagers in there uh, but it's the ministry of Fisher fisheries who is the main protagonist who is now helping us scale up the project or these type of projects in the rest of indonesia and who is the uh, ministry that makes the connection to the international financing institution so it's different everywhere uh, but it's it's in all cases it it is like uh, it's a social problem right bringing bringing different people together and connect the pieces and having in a way the science and the backup to 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 make it plausible enough that people want to do this investment thank you it's clearly multi-layered and it really is dependent on the, the situation and what, what you're looking at and where it is clearly yeah um okay uh valeria let's go with you um are there other communities with similar disparities in water service and gender roles that you've used to compare to your study area um, in Mexico or somewhere else? No, it, in, well, I guess it could be anywhere in terms of any other communities with similar disparities. Um, it doesn't need to be mm -hmm. specifically in Mexico, just anything that you've come, come across. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I am not really sure about Mexico because I only focus in that area. But I am pretty sure that that happens in in any other marginalized area in Mexico, all, all over the, the the country, and uh, in the world. For example, uh, as I mentioned, I am doing this collaboration with this uh, Dutch uh, firm, and recently we had a webinar and also a workshop where we uh, kind of com not not compare. We we talk about. Uh, a similar water uh, crisis issue in uh, Kanagi Nagar in, in Chennai, India, where also women are the ones responsible of collecting uh, the water, of uh, and also to protect like their families and their houses and their their uh, neighborhood from flooding. So it's it's not only the the, the issue of not having a, a water. They all, in in that context they also have another uh, extra problem. But yeah, what is very surprising, or maybe it already stopped being surprising for me, is that women are the ones who are taking those roles. So I can only uh, talk about that case. And yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, let's flip back to you, Matthias. Um, the Building with Nature book, does it address riverbank restoration? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, there's that answer. And then, all right, here's the next question. In Louisiana, dredged material from river bottoms are federally not always allowed to be used on the coastline to build up to build up the coastline. Uh, there's some federal regulation that prevents this because of supposed dangerous chemicals in the dredged material. Okay, so lots of money is spent on taking dredged material to specialized landfills. Uh, any issues or knowledge of that in in the U.S. or internationally? That's so interesting. It, it, it's, it's very interesting and in, in a way Play ripener is sort of an example, right? Where you sort of have an, an intermediary treatment. But one of the one of the challenges with using these approaches in the United States is that 
the regulatory regime is quite different from the European regulatory regime. And that had to do that with the fact that the regulatory regime, as we have in the United States, is sort of developed in the 70s and is born uh, as a re sort of reaction to um, uh, excessive extraction and pollution of uh, resources and ecosystems and is really focused on sort of conservation and restoration. And I come from a culture where in, in a way we, in the Netherlands, we've been working in some way with nature for about a thousand years in order to deal with flood risk, et cetera. And we have had to rely on nature in a very different way because we needed to harness its forces because we didn't have fossil fuels, et cetera, for the first, uh, let's say, uh, eight of those 10 centuries. And so what you see is that there's a more, in a, in a, from a regulatory perspective, uh, a, a sort of greater appreciation that once you intervene in nature, it changes. And so you it's a you use nature to do development and you develop and and build with nature rather than the focus of nature is to conserve it and to protect it. And that mindset I think is really problematic for the United States and that has to do so I understand where it comes from, but in a rapidly changing climate where we in the anthropogene where we are actually already reshaping nature in a massive way the idea of conservation might not be productive and we should change that perspective and start to appreciate nature uh, uh, for uh, as a tool to in some way not only restore and, and, and bring back but to realign natural systems and constructed systems. All right. Um, I think this is our, our last question, and it's for you, Matthias. Uh, any projects uh, in either in visionary form or any kind of stage of development uh, in the US right now? For us, uh, mm -hmm. building with nature, uh, we're. I think there's a really interesting experiment happening where we're sort of uh, partially involved in because we're doing a lot of the coastal uh, designs in, in in Boston, Massachusetts. Is the Stone Living Lab, which is trying to sort of uh, use the harbor or start to think of the Boston Harbor as a test bed for these type of solutions. We find that in Boston, in particular. Uh, there are certain areas that are from a regulatory perspective a bit easier to work in than in uh, New York, where we can start to experiment uh, at a relatively small scale with these type of solutions. And we're really happy that the Stone Living Lab is sort of setting up the pilots in the harbor to figure that stuff uh, out. Another thing that we are looking at is we are now working on the financial district climate uh, master plan in New York and lower Manhattan. And there, one of the real challenges is, uh, can we build a coastal protection system on land? And we're doing that to the north and we're doing that to the south and to the west, but we feel that we might not do it there. <clears throat> and that means that we need, we might have to go in water and that brings with it, of course, a can of worms, but it also offers opportunities for these type of solutions. And it offers opportunities for these type of solutions in terms of mitigation, because once you start to do anything in water, you need to mitigate it elsewhere. And that means that actually a byproduct of this project could be, and that's a sort of interesting thing, is an sort of additional investment in these type of solutions elsewhere in the estuary. And I think that could be very, very interesting. As we are starting to protect our cities against climate, we're 
going to have adverse impacts with some of the stuff that we built, but that also offers opportunities for mitigation elsewhere that could actually be pretty phenomenal. All right, thank you. I think that's it for our questions. Man, we really got through a lot of questions there. Great job, you guys. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think we'll wrap up just a couple of housekeeping items to remind everyone um, we are recording this session and it will be available up on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and we'll also have a slide deck, uh, a PDF copy of the slide decks available on our webcast webpage. Just head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast and folks don't forget to log those CM credits. They are available and uh, head over again to our webcast webpage so that you can register for all of our upcoming sessions. Uh, so thanks to both of you, uh, Matthias and Valeria, and I know I butchered your, both of your first names. I'm sorry. No <laughs> um, but thanks to both of you and thank you to the International Division of APA for hosting today's session. Uh, this was really interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed this one. So thanks to you both. Uh, everyone have a great weekend and we will talk next time. Bye, everybody. Thank Thanks for your great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hosting us. Bye, Valeria.